From tasing a suspect to death, they just kept tasing them and tasing them and tasing them. To doing shocking things in public. He does a female pat down, which was the groping of my breast and the groping of my vagina. Here are five cops who thought they could get away with anything. Disclaimer. Crying his way into number one, we have Christopher Hayes, a hero turned villain with a very sick ink. Hayes was facing counts of felony false imprisonment and three counts of battery. For four years, Christopher Hayes, a former Army veteran, had worked with the San Diego Police Department as a stellar officer who served with distinction, even rescuing a woman from a fire, or so they thought. In December 2013, a woman came forward alleging that Hayes had touched and groped her inappropriately during pat-downs while he was on duty. Hayes was up upset by the accusation and proclaimed his innocence to anyone who would listen. But an investigation would reveal that there were more women he had assaulted. This is now the seventh woman to come forward alleging Officer Chris Hayes abused his badge since Team 10 broke this story last week. The first six women have claimed sexual assault or battery. Not one, not two, but seven victims. They all had similar stories. We were talking and he was like, you know that I could take you to jail. I was like, but I wasn't driving the car. I didn't do anything. He's like, well, if you go down on me, I won't take you to jail. Hayes resigned, saying he felt betrayed by the department. But if Hayes thought that was the end, he had another thing coming. Days later, he was arrested and charged. With his wife standing by his side, Hayes pleaded not guilty. At his preliminary hearing in April, three victims described what Hayes had done to them. One woman told the court that Hayes pulled over at a bus stop and offered her a ride. After she entered his car, he told her that he had forgotten to pat her down. Hayes then took her to a secluded area. He does a female pat down, which was the groping of my breast and the groping of my Another victim said that Hayes had picked her up and taken her to a friend's house, where he proceeded to conduct his version of a pat-down. Then he forced her to stay with him as he made inappropriate comments. The whole thing was obscene. Should, the conversation should have never happened. He should not have been in the driveway talking to me about the color of my underwear. The third woman was drunk and arguing with her boyfriend when Hayes appeared. After handcuffing the boyfriend and sending him off with a threat, Hayes told her that she was too drunk to go home alone and he took her home. But he followed her in and ordered her to lift her shirt. So I lifted both of them and he said all the way until where um, the bottom of my breast and my nipple were exposed. Then he told her to do the most horrifying thing. He drops his hands towards his growing area and thrust his hips and says, just touch it. The terrified woman did as he said. I'm gonna get hurt if I don't listen to him. I need to get out of here. Hayes' attorney argued that the women were under the influence and their memories could be hazy, but the judge wasn't convinced, and the case was set to go to trial. Before his sentencing, one of the victims had a chance to speak to Hayes, and she did not hold back. He is a disgrace to the uniforms he has worn. Hayes' wife took the stand, saying her husband would never commit the crimes he was accused of. There are things I may never know the answer to, but what I do know is my husband would not deliberately hurt others. Hayes gave a tearful apology to his wife and his family, barely addressing what he'd done to his victims. I would like to say that I am sorry for anything I have done that has caused anyone pain. I have always tried to help people and do good so now that I have hurt someone is not something that I'm very proud of. He hoped to get probation and maybe community service, but the judge pulled the rug out from under them and sentenced Hayes to a year behind bars. Hayes wiped tears as his wife burst into tears. <laughs> The former officer was put in cuffs and taken to jail. If you think that's shocking, wait till you hear what this chief of police said in court. I took the money, and mind you, this does not excuse it, but from drug dealers. But before we get to that, Marcus Eberhardt and Howard Weems. Killing a man because he's too tired to walk sounds crazy, but that's exactly what these two did. Eberhardt and Weems were charged with one count each of murder, involuntary manslaughter, and six counts of violation of oath by a public officer. On April 11th, 2014, East Police responded to a 911 call at an apartment complex. Gregory Towns Jr. was in a domestic dispute with his girl Friend. The minute he saw the police, he ran to the woods, closely followed by the police. But Towns would never come out of those woods alive. His family would find out that he'd been tased to death by the two officers in those woods. Towns had rolled down an embankment, was in handcuffs, and out of breath. Yet Eberhardt used his taser on him ten times. Total shock time of 4.30. 
47 seconds. While Eames used his three times, it took over a year for both men to be indicted and charged with his death. At the trial, the defense attorneys argued Town's death had more to do with his illness and that the officers were well within their rights to use tasers. But paramedics and neighbors took the stand, testifying that Towns was already compliant and there was no need for the tasers. He did something, in this case, that should have never been done. And so it was important to our office to restore our confidence in our criminal justice system to let people know that if you are doing the wrong thing, that the system applies equally to everyone, to police officers as well as civilian defendants. After a day of deliberations, the jury returned with a verdict. Eberhardt was found guilty on all counts, while Weems was convicted on the lesser charges of involuntary manslaughter and reckless conduct. Before the judge ruled on their sentence, Town's girlfriend Aisha Smith held her three-year-old son's hand and spoke about regretting making the 911 call. Me calling the officers that day, it made the whole situation worse. Um, you carried a lot of guilt. I carry a lot of guilt to this day. When Weems got a chance to speak, he apologized to the family, but Smith wasn't having it and lashed out in court. I do extend my condolences to the town's family. Nobody killed. Nobody killed. Nobody. She was immediately ordered out of the courtroom and spoke to reporters. I don't want to hear anything he has to say. I just really don't want to hear anything he has to say. Um... Gregory's not here to respond for himself, so I did it for him. Eberhardt was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole, and Weems was sentenced to five years. Two men's stupid actions cost another man his life. You'd think this kind of poor judgment doesn't happen often. Think again. Wait till you hear what this sheriff does to keep up with his crazy addiction. Number three, Charles Reeder. We're talking about Charles Reeder, who fancies himself some kind of Robin Hood. Reeder faced 18 charges, including first degree and engaging in a pattern of corrupt activity and tampering with records. Once upon a time, Charles Reeder wore the highest ranking badge in Pine County's law enforcement when he was sheriff. A year later, he shot to nationwide fame as a horrified public followed the investigation into Ohio's worst homicide, the 2016 Roden family massacre. Eight members of the Roden family were found murdered. Two years later, they found the culprits, four members of another local family, the Wagners. Reeder's face flashed across TV screens, a shining example of good police work and his no-nonsense approach to drug and gang arrests. We declared war on drugs uh, when I was appointed the sheriff in 2015. We came together with the Piketon Police Department, the Waverly Police Department to form a major drugs and crimes task force. And the reality is, after the alert that I put out, people were shocked that there was gang affiliation coming to Pike County. But something sinister lurked in the shadows of this sheriff's fame. A month later, an anonymous complaint came in about salary and benefits being collected in the sheriff's office. State officials raided the sheriff's office and what they found was much worse than they thought. Apart from envelopes containing cash being tampered with in evidence, impounded vehicles were auctioned off at ludicrous prices, only to be resold for more than double. And the man pulling the strings was none other than the town's favorite sheriff, Charles Reeder himself. It turned out that the people's sheriff had a gambling problem and had used his office to fund the habit. He also owed deputies and a car dealer money. Reader swore he was being framed. The following year, he stepped down as sheriff and was indicted on 23 charges. He swore at the deputy who served him the papers and pleaded not guilty in court. Yes, sir, how you doing? It would be better if you'd get my property. Well, understood. There you go, sir. Vowing to fight the charges against him, but a year later, Reeder pleaded guilty to five charges, including theft in office and tampering with evidence. Several people spoke on his behalf, claiming that the job pressures had gotten to him. There's no greater man than Charlie Reeder. Judge Patricia Cosgrove listened attentively as Reeder made a long and tearful plea for leniency. As a sheriff of Ohio, I should, <clears throat> excuse me, I shed bad light on the office of sheriff. I can only ask that my staff, their families, the community, and my family who is here today will forgive me for the undue stress I caused them. For this, I am terribly sorry. 
I stood in this court on September 24th and pled guilty to the charges against me to accept responsibility for my conduct. I have and I now pray that the court will find mercy on me and I beg the court if they see fit to grant me community control even with the strictest sanctions that I have proven to this court in the past two and a half years. But before he took his seat, the Cosgrove had some questions for Reader. I have a couple of questions for you. The big question uh, I have, and is on everyone's mind, I'm assuming, is why did you cut open these evidence envelopes and take the money out, and then in some cases you put it back, although you were caught because the envelopes had been unsealed uh, and sealed again improperly, and the denominations did not match what was taken at the crime scene or from those individuals. Uh, I guess, why did you take the money? Reader tried to justify his actions, claiming he was some kind of Robin Hood. I took the money, and mind you, this does not excuse it, but from drug dealers that took it from parents of very poor people in this county. That money, regardless of what the state and what the media has claimed in the past years of a gambling problem and that money being used for gambling, was used when there was a tree planted in the name of the Shelton boy. It's at the entrance of Western High School to the left as soon as you pull in. Nobody could pay for that tree. Nobody offered to pay for that tree. A drug dealer did. But no paper trail showed Reader had supported a single cause. What you're saying here as to why you claim you use the money for various charitable community things. And then, uh, but the, the PSI officer notes that there's no documentation that you used it for those things. His answers did nothing to convince Judge Cosgrove that he was remorseful, and she had little sympathy for a man who tarnished the badge and broke the public's trust. Reader's wife and kids cried as the judge sentenced him to three years behind bars. Reader was escorted out of the courthouse and taken into custody by the deputies he once led. Stealing from drug dealers is one thing, but stealing from charities? That's exactly what one sheriff did, and it's not even the worst part. Meet David Oliver. This chief of police's fall from from grace to grass will give you whiplash. Oliver was charged with unauthorized use of property and unlawful restraint. Crystal Casterline, a patrol officer with the department, accused him of harassment. Brimfield's former chief of police had officially become a mope. Investigation into the lawsuit led to many officers backing her claim, but they soon found Oliver had been up to much more in office. Oliver stole money meant for charity. He also went into evidence and picked weapons, some of which he sold and others he kept for himself. Oliver pleaded guilty to the charges against him. Before sentencing, his attorney tried to paint a positive picture of his client. Mr. Oliver, as I think everybody in this room knows, uh, served the township of Brimfield first as a police officer uh, and later as a chief. He served approximately 10 years as the chief of police. Uh, as everyone knows, Brimfield is a small town that has its own small town politics. Um, I think politics have played a role in this case. Claiming that he pleaded guilty so he wouldn't have to drag his family through court. Oliver got a chance to speak, but instead of addressing his victim, Oliver claimed it was all lies. I mean, I, I, one question, and I'm not going to be long, Your Honor, but one question I would ask is if there was a sworn police officer who thought there was a crime that had been committed in 2012, why didn't he report it? The secondary thing about this is I never heard anything about a hostile work environment or assault or he also said the other officers were ganging up on him, but the prosecution fired right back at him, reminding the court of his heinous behavior as chief of police. Um, I would like to say that perhaps Mr. Oliver should question um, what kind of leadership skills he used with those people that they were too afraid to come forward until my office showed up to investigate. And people were more than happy to tell us about his crappy, horrible, deplorable behavior. He makes no apologies today. He has no remorse for what he put those people through. It's astounding, Your Honor. Officer Casterline finally got a chance to face the man who made her life miserable for close to two years. 
I was so eager to learn and felt so unsure about what to do at times. Looking back, I can understand the frustration and the resentment my supervisors must have felt. Many times I would be so unsure, but the chief was someone that I could trust and come to at any time with any question. And with me, he strongly encouraged me to use his open door policy. She disagreed with the plea agreement, but she made a lengthy emotional statement about what she'd been through for the past few years. I told him over and over that he was making me uncomfortable. But the physical assaults and sexual harassment continued on, on an almost daily basis for two years. I became more and more withdrawn and depressed. I truly felt there was no way out. Through Casterline's testimony, Oliver dramatically shook his head and made faces, but the judge didn't buy his act. You've become the moat that you wrote about in your book. Do you realize that? She sentenced Oliver to two years of probation and ordered him to surrender his police certificate. Oliver was also fined and ordered to pay $1,304 in restitution to the charities he ripped off. And this was not the only time officers have been forced to arrest their chief. One sheriff couldn't stop getting arrested. Number 5. Todd Pate After getting a lenient sentence for a severe crime, you'd think this sheriff would be a little less arrogant. You'd be wrong. Pate faced nine charges, including first-degree assault, operating a motor vehicle under the influence and four counts of wanton endangerment. On March 8, 2019, a 911 call came in at the Breckenridge County Sheriff's Office. The driver had fled the scene. Officers later found a damaged truck and the county sheriff, Todd Pate, in the nearby woods trying to hide beer bottles. Pate reeked of alcohol. His eyes were bloodshot. His speech was slurred and he could barely hold himself up. And this was not the first time he'd been arrested for a DUI as sheriff. Back in 2015, Pate had been arrested for DUI and reckless driving. All he got was a fine of $800. He wasn't going to get away so easy this time. Pate was charged and indicted on multiple accounts, a shocking fall from grace for a sheriff who'd once been on Oprah for his exemplary police work. Pate agreed to a plea deal that would give him a sentence of just 75 days. All he had to do was plead guilty. Easy peasy, right? But things didn't quite go as planned. In court for the hearing, Judge Janet Crocker had begun addressing the court when she noticed Pate was busy doing something else. Uh, is that your phone, Mr. Pate? Yes, it is. You need to put it away. Okay. I was just had a. You need to put it away. Okay. Yeah. Not a great way to kick off proceedings. Instead of pleading guilty, Pate began questioning the judge. It your desire to change your plea uh, from not guilty to guilty. Do I have to answer that yes or no, or can I make somewhat of a statement? That's that, what is, I, that is a yes or no answer, sir. Will I have the opportunity to say anything further? If you, it is your intention to change your plea from not guilty to guilty, then I will take your plea, and certainly you'll have an opportunity to make any statement that you want to make. But if it is not your intent to enter a guilty plea at this time, then I'm going to set your case for jury trial, and you're going to stop wasting my time and everybody else's time this afternoon. Ma'am, I'm not trying to waste your time. And then is it your <laughs> intention to enter a guilty plea at this time or not, sir? No. Crocker ignored Pate's tantrum and talked to the prosecuting attorney. Your Honor, we would move to revoke the defendant's bond at this time. We, had to, we took part in a lengthy mediation. We agreed to continue this case two months to enter this plea today. Uh, I think we've inconvenienced the entire court system by canceling the pretrial date. He would be taken back to jail if he didn't decide, but Crocker gave Pate another chance. Mr. Vows, would you like some additional opportunity to meet with your client this afternoon before we proceed at this time? Um, I don't believe it'd do any harm. I'll make it very, very quick. I know we've already delayed the court, and uh, I'll report back within a couple of minutes. All right, I'll give you, I'll give you another ten minutes for that. All right, thank All right, you. Thank you. Ten minutes later, the court was back in session, but Pate was still insisting on being allowed to complain about the first-degree assault charges. Can I say a few things, or...? I need to understand what it is that we're doing here like today, to Mr. Pate. Yes, I had every intention of coming in here today and entering a guilty plea based on the, um, based on the mediation that we had. Uh, it's very difficult for me to enter a guilty plea to felony-related charges that I've been in law enforcement for 25 years and never have I ever charged someone with felony charges on a situation pertaining to this. 
uh, that was similar to this. And boy, did he talk. At a point, his lawyer had to butt in and explain why he should keep quiet. If I may interject, just if you intend not to enter a plea, don't say very much about the case because what you say here under oath will be used against you. But Pete continued to go on and on and on and on and on. It's difficult for me to enter a guilty plea um, for a lot of reasons, and I don't want this court to think that I am trying to minimize, take away from, or deflect any responsibility that I had in this situation that occurred. Uh, I do absolutely feel like that because of my bad decisions, this whole case took a turn that it wouldn't have taken had it not been the Breckenridge County Sheriff. Judge Crocker decided to get things back on track. I think we are back, Mr. Payton, and, and probably should have, have stayed in the place where we started. But this chatterbox would not take a hint and even started taking jabs at the prosecuting attorney. I think everybody in this room wants this over with. And if I could address Blake, Blake, I hope you learn from this case. I'm not mad at you. I'm not in any way upset with you. Mr. Pate, not that it we have reached that point now. Okay. It, this is either a yes or no. Are you going to enter your plea or not? I guess everybody thinks it's funny. Well, certainly not the people who I think are, are here with you today, I Mr. No, they don't. I've broken everybody's heart. But it's hard for me when I see Mr. Chambers sitting over there smiling. Finally, Pate agreed to plead guilty. Let me just plea and get it over with for everybody. Plead to something that I absolutely do not feel good about, but I don't want you to try to send me to the penitentiary for years and years. But the judge's patience with Pate had run out. Probably I think unusual, we're done. At this do point it. in time, I think we're done. And so let me tell you where I think we are today, is that we have executed plea documents. Whether or not Mr. Pate uh, has the right to withdraw the, his plea now that he's executed those plea documents remain to be seen. Pate was taken to jail and held without bond. After spending some time in jail, Pate pleaded guilty and served his sentence of 75 days behind bars with credit to time served.